Right, this week's Torah portion, Vayechi, it means, and he lived. Uh, this is the last Torah portion of Bereshit, of Genesis. Um, and then we get to move into Exodus, such a great book. Um, so this is really like, it's tying off all the loose ends to do, you know, all the children of Israel, the children of Jacob are now in Egypt. Um, and Yosef has revealed himself to his brothers. And um, let's just jump straight in. Genesis 47, verse 28. And Yaakov lived in the land of Mitzrayim. So that's Jacob and Egypt. It's just the translation. They're the Hebrew words. Um, Yaakov lived in the land of Mitzrayim 17 years. So the length of Yaakov's life was 147 years. Let's look at the number 17. Uh, scripture is very precise. The numbers mean things. Um, interestingly, it's the same number of years Yosef lived in Canaan before being sold into slavery. So you've got a nice little parallel there. Now, let's actually look at the gematria. So for those who don't know gematria, every Hebrew let most Hebrew letters have a numerical equivalent. And if you take those, that means a word can add up to a certain number. And you get these interesting illusions occur. So we're not forming doctrine from these things, but it, it points us in interesting directions, as we're about to see. The word tov, which is Hebrew for good, the gematria adds up to 17. Yeshua said, so Yeshua said to him, why do you call me tov, good? No one is good except one, Elohim. Another word is tzavach, which is translated as sacrifice or slaughtering. So, for example, it is the Passover slaughtering, the Passover <coughs> sacrifice of Yah. Uh, this would be the Lamb, who passed over the houses of the children of Yisrael and Mitzrayim when he smote the Mitzrites and delivered our households. So we've got this link, the Passover sacrifice, good, all add up to 17. Also, we know that Yeshua was our Passover Lamb. Uh, that's what the Passover Lamb pointed to. But he, having offered one slaughter offering for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of Elohim. Did I see a hand up somewhere? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, deeg. The word deeg means to fish. Is the verb form to fish. That adds up to 17. Jeremiah 16, verse 14. Therefore see, the days are coming, declares Yah, when it is no longer said, Yah lives who brought up the children of Yisrael from the land of Mitzrayim, but Yah lives who brought up the children of Yisrael from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I shall bring them back into their land I, that I gave to their fathers. This is talking about the, the exiles. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yah, and they shall fish, dig, for them. And after that, I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt from them, from every mountain and every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. We're going to make some interesting connections next. So let's look at fish and fishermen. Mark 1 says, And walking by the Sea of Galil, he, that is Yeshua, saw Shimon and Andri, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Yeshua said to them, come follow me and I shall make you become fishers of men. Thus fulfilling what we just read in Jeremiah. Who and what would the disciples fish for? But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael. This is what Jeremiah was speaking about when he says, I shall bring all your brothers from the north, from the south. Also, Yeshua said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael. This is a critical verse when you're coming out of mainstream Christianity. Because Yeshua said that the sole purpose he came for was for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not the church. So let's link all this back to our Parsha. Parsha is just a Hebrew word for passage of scripture, essentially. Genesis 48, this is a bit further on. This is when... Yaakov is blessing Ephraim and Manasseh, and he crosses his hands over. The messenger who has redeemed me from evil, bless the youths. Let my name be called upon them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzhak, and let them increase to a multitude in the midst of the earth. The word increase is dagah, which is to spawn, i.e. to become numerous. Now, what's interesting, this comes, the, it comes from the root word dag, which is a fish. So earlier on we had dig, which is the verb to fish. 
Daga, which means to spawn, to become numerous, comes from the word dag, which is the noun, fish. So dig and dag are very similar Hebraically. Yaakov blessed the house of Yosef, i.e. the house of Israel, the scattered tribes, the lost kingdom, to increase and multiply like fish, fish that will then be fished by fishers of men. Yeshua says, I have only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, a people connecting it. All of this, this is why gematria can be fun. It gives you some really interesting illusions. Is, uh, so let's keep going with this uh, dig to fish. Um, Yeshua said to them, bring some of the fish which you now have caught. So this is after he's died and resurrected and they've gone off fishing and they don't recognize him. Shimon Kephar went up and dragged the net to the land filled with 153 big fishes. And though there were many, so many, the net was not broken. The passage here mentions the number 153. This is interesting because... Let, uh, the phrase Chapesach, the Passover, which we linked earlier, that has a gematria of 153. So go out, take for yourselves lambs according to your clans, and slaughter Chapesach, the Passover lamb. That has a number 153. Now, the word covenant, which is berit, is very interesting. So let's link this to Jeremiah, the fulfillment of the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda coming back together. For this is the covenant, the berit, which I shall make with the house of Yisrael after those days, declares Yah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. The Gematria is 612, which is 153 times 4. Now, for those who are here for Bereshit, what does the number 4 represent? Yeshua, Messiah, we showed how the, the f number four, which is in the middle of the seven, i.e. the menorah, Yeshua is that central branch. So what you do, you take the covenant, Berit, uh, sorry, you take HaPesach, 153, you add Yeshua to the Passover, you therefore have the covenant. Do people see what I'm getting at? HaPesach comes to 153, we showed that Messiah is linked to the number four, so you take the Passover, you add Yeshua to the Passover, you have your covenant in Jeremiah 31, which is all about the regathering of the exiles, which the regathering of the lost tribes of Israel was likened to fishing with the fishes of men. Is everyone with me? It's pretty neat. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't figure this out. This is where it's good to learn from other sources. Um, so let's go back to our Torah portion. And the time for Yisrael, uh, the time for Yisrael to die drew near, and he called his son Yosef and said to him, "Now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please put your hand under my thigh and show kindness and truth to me. Please do not bury me in Mitzrayim." Let's just stop there. If I have found favor in your eyes, uh, let's translate this into Christian lingo. If I have found grace in your eyes, it's the same word. Grace. Apparently, he had to merit it. He had to earn it. Just a little aside. But I shall lie with my fathers, and you shall take me up out of Mitzrayim and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I do as you have said. And he said to me, swear to me. And he swore to him, and Yisrael bowed himself on the head of the bed. Yaakov made sure that he will be buried in the promised land, in the tomb where his forefathers have been buried. Yaakov's burial in the promised land served as a reminder to his progeny of the promises and the covenant made by Yah. What did we read? Um, we read this actually in Israel part one. What were the covenants of promise? Part of the covenant was that your seed will go to a nation, be oppressed for 400 years, and then you will leave, and then you will inherit the land. So th um, this is what Yaakov is telling the people. Take me out of the land because you're not going to stay here. He wanted to make sure that his children never forgot that Egypt was not their home. Sorry, wrong there. That, that's going to bug me. <laughs> there will be several times when the children of Israel would long for Egypt once they've left. 
In Numbers 11, we read this, And the mixed multitude who were in their midst lusted greatly, so that the children of Israel also wept and said, Who is giving us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate without cost in Mitzrayim, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Don't forget the garlic. But now our throat is dried up. There is naught to look at but this manna. They were unhappy with the provision that Yah had made for them. Do we do this? He gives us something and we want more. Are we happy with the bread? What's bread an analogy of? His word. Are we happy with the word he has given us? Or are we looking off in all crazy places for new doctrinal understanding crack? Because we want something new and fancy to flash in front of people. Yeshua said, but Yeshua said to him, no one having his hand, put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the reign of Elohim. So this mixed multitude was saying they were not fit for the promised land. They were looking back to Egypt, the very thing that they'd been delivered from. Let's take this further. In Hebrews 11, By belief Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he was about to receive as an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by belief he sojourned in the land of promise as a stranger dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for the city having foundations, whose builder and maker is Elohim. But now they long for a better place that is a heavenly. Therefore Elohim is not ashamed to be called their Elohim, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham was looking forward to that promise. And because of that, Elohim was not ashamed of him. By looking back, we bring shame to our Heavenly Father. So when we're, you know, longing for how things were easier back when we didn't have to do this tour, we we could do whatever we wanted, we're bringing shame. We're thus being unfit for the kingdom as well. Let's take this further. And so Yeshua also suffered outside the gate to, be, to set apart the people with his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For we have no lasting city here, but we seek the one coming. Are we acting like sojourners in this life or have we made our stay in the world? Do we look forward Or are we looking back to our Egypt, whatever our Egypt was? Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart shall also be. Where is your heart? Is it set on that heavenly calling or are you too busy with looking back or even too busy with what's going on around you now are we looking forward with Yeshua are you minding the things from above or the things of this world this this ties into being minded with the spirit to mind the things of the spirit as opposed to those of the world why are you even doing this walk Are you doing it to undergo heart circumcision that you may become like the sun? Or is that the lie you tell yourself to hide that this is actually about making yourself feel better about your quote-unquote eternal destiny? How about making yourself look more righteous than others? Oh, I know this and I know that and I'm doing feast this and I'm doing Torah that and I'm wearing my tzitzit and you're not and how dare you? How about making you sound smart, enlightened and have a knowledge of truth? I know more than you. Is this what this walk is about? And I, I, this is a rhetorical question, but we'd like to think that this is not what we're doing. And quite often we can have good intentions, but actually we can be doing that without even realizing it. It's, your intentions don't matter. A lot of people have good intentions. Good intentions is not getting you to that kingdom. Heart circumcision, on the other hand, comes at a cost. With that, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because that's what you're doing. If you're doing this walk for all those reasons, you're a hypocrite. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you do eat up widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. Because of this, you shall receive greater judgment. We've all seen people like that doing the showy prayers and, oh, Father, come on. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you go about the land and the sea to win one convert. And when he is one, you make him a son of Gehenna twofold more than yourselves. Are you trying to win people over to your version of the truth? Even, even if you are factually right, how are you going about to get that convert? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you tithe the mint and the anise and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, the right ruling, the compassion and the belief, the faith. These need to be, have been done. Now, this is key. These need to have been done, the weightier matters, without neglecting the others. So, yes, you need to tithe. Yes, you need to do these mechanical things. But if you're doing it just about these mechanical things, you fall under that. Are you... Look, I can keep Shabbat, I can keep the feast, I can tithe, and I can still be a right miserable sod to everyone. Where's the heart circumcision? Where's your, where is that uh, fruit of the Spirit that Yeshua walked in? Because, yes, Yeshua was perfectly sinless, but he also had the fruit of the Spirit. Thus setting him apart. Because, let's face it, the Pharisees were keeping Torah better than any of us. But Yeshua called them hypocrites. Let's keep going. Blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. They were so focused on doing this little thing like that that they completely missed out being merciful, compassionate, undergoing heart circumcision, thus swallowing a camel. This is rife in messianic body right now. Rife. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, so that the outside of them becomes clean too. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly indeed look well, but inside are filled with dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Going back to that, that list I put up, why are you doing this walk? Are you doing it to look righteous? Are you doing it to look enlightened? Or are you doing it truly because you know this is truth? So you too outwardly indeed appear righteous to men, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the blood of the prophets. Thus you bear against witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who did murder the prophets and you fill up the measure of your fathers. There's many people that would like to think that when Yeshua, that when they would have been around the time of Yeshua, that they would, they would have been like, yeah, he's the Messiah. I would say no. I would say there is a lot of good people right now that would have probably been up there putting him on that cross. Serpents, brood of adders, how would you escape the judgment of Gehenna? There are a lot of believers that are on this walk that do so for this life and not the next. Um, it's become almost like a fashion statement. Oh, I'm Hebrew roots. I keep Torah. Woo! Give me a gold star. Really? Are you do Why are you doing it? They do all of these righteous things to please their flesh. Let's take this a step further. Let no one deprive you of the prize. One who takes delight in false humility. Oh, I see a lot of that. Oh, I'm humble. Is your humility genuine? This is something that the Father had to like whip out of me over the last two years. This is why I'm in a job that I serve people. That has brought me down a peg or two. And the worship of messengers, taking his stand on what he has not seen, puffed up by his fleshly mind. We know that knowledge puffs up. People get puffed up with pride and arrogance when they have this knowledge instead of applying it. And not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows within the growth of Elohim. He's saying there's people that have false humility and they're puffed up by knowledge. They're not holding fast to the head which means they're disconnected from Yeshua. Now, if you have a body part that's not connected to the head, what happens? It becomes gangrenous. It dies. If then you died with Messiah from the elementary matters of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch and do not taste and do not handle. People in modern Christianity will say that this is talking about Levitical law. This is, it, Paul was actually um, hounding the Gnostics here. Gnostics fasted. Satanists fast, by the way. They have these things that when they're about to cast a spell, they fast and they stop touching me. They go vegetarian as well, which is interesting. 
um, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which are all to perish with use according to the commands and teachings of men. These indeed, this is the key, have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed worship, humiliation and harsh treatment of the body of no value at all, only for the satisfaction of the flesh. People were fasting and doing these big showy prayers and saying, well, I don't touch this to appear righteous to men. Thus being the whitewashed tombs of Matthew 23. Beware of doing your kind deeds before men, says Yeshua, in order to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in the heavens. Thus, when you do a kind deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, in the congregations and in the streets to be praised by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. There's an interesting historical thing that in the synagogues, when you gave your money, they, they did the money receptacle in such a way that the more money you put in, the more noise it made. This is what you should say, and don't sound a trumpet. So this is why we have the box at the back and we don't do the collective, um, the you know, forced collection, as it were. Because of this, it causes people to go, oh, well, they didn't do anything. They didn't put anything in there. Oh, look, my envelope's bigger than their envelope. I mean, come on. And then people start gossiping and you get this judging going on. But when you do a kind deed, do not left, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your kind deed shall indeed be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the congregations and on the corners of the streets to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. I've seen this so much in churches. People getting all emotional and they stand up and they give their showy prayer and they're just going around in circles in their prayer. And it's like, you've just said the same thing like four times. And, but you, when you pray, go into your room and having shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. I'd rather have the Father's reward, not men's reward. And when praying, do not keep on babbling like the Gentiles, for they think that they shall be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is why I say when you pray, pray from an honest heart. Pray with integrity. Don't just pray for the sake of it, because he can see through all your religious games. He can see through your facade. Just be honest. This, then, is the way you should pray. Our Father who is in the heavens, let your name be set apart. Let your reign come. Let your desires be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where's I in this? Nowhere to be seen. It's all about the Father first. Give us today our daily bread. This is more than just bread, bread. It's talking about your daily word, your daily needs. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hypocrisy or lack thereof, you choose which one is going to be in your life. If you expect to be forgiven and you don't forgive others, do not lead us into trial, but deliver us from the wicked one, because yours is the reign and the power and the esteem forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father shall also forgive you. With what measure you give out, you will be measured with. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither shall your father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not be sad faced like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that they appear to be fasting to men. Truly I say, they have their reward. But they were, they were going, oh, I'm fasted, I'm too weak, I'm fasting, righteous me. They've had their reward from men. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Now we get to what we read earlier. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Changes the meaning of that. Now we have the context. People think it's all about what being focused on the world and not focused on heaven now we have proper context it's actually about being rewarded by men and trying to look righteous for where your treasure is there your heart shall be also again why do you do this walk are you doing it to look good in front of people because if you are your heart is actually focused on pleasing people not elohim you mean to say that i can be fasting in order to please my flesh sounds a bit weird doesn't it why are you fasting? Are you doing it to... Because 
We have to get past this idea that the flesh is just physical. You have a fleshly desire inside of you. So if you're fasting to appear righteous, you're actually you're, you're, you're boosting your ego. That's what you're doing, that fleshly part of you. You can do kind deeds in order to boost pride and ego. Oh, look at me giving to the poor. Look at me doing this nice stuff for people. You know, you get people that, that they'll make sure that the cameras are figuratively there before they do a kind deed. Sounding the trumpet like... Da -da -da. No, no. That I can appear humble and meek in front of men and it really be all about me. False humility. That I can do all of this to fool myself into thinking that I am so righteous. Look at me doing this walk perfectly. That all of this is the equivalent to building treasures here on earth. Talk about taking a good thing and perverting it into something wicked. I mean, taking Torah, you can take the Torah and make it about you. You can take Torah and make it about being righteous. And you, you see this on Facebook and YouTube. People just killing each other over this stuff. Like, oh, you heretic. And, uh, when will we just get over that? All of this was because Yaakov said to Joseph, we do not belong in Egypt. We do not belong in this world. And the problem is that we come from the world and we come into this walk and we take all this worldly way of thinking. We're doing this walk, but with the world's mindset. Does this make sense? Can people see the links? Simple logical steps. <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay. Am I good to carry on? Is everyone keeping up? Cool. Genesis 48. And after these events, came, it came to be that it was said to Yosef, See, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Yaakov was told, See, your son Yosef is coming to you. And Yisrael strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. And Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz, which is near Jerusalem, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said to me, See, I am making you bear fruit, and shall increase you to make you an assembly of peoples, a kahal, an ecclesia, a church of peoples, and give this land to your seed after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Mitzrayim, before I came to you in Mitzrayim, are mine. As Reuben and Shimon, they are mine. Your offspring, whom you shall bring forth after them, are yours. And let them be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So Manasseh and Ephraim were to be part of the inheritance. We see they had their own allotted land in the promised land. And I, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, and there was but a little distance to go from Ephrat. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, that is, Beit Lehem. So, not long after Yaakov was promised that he would be fruitful and become an assembly of peoples, literally the next, in the same chapter, Rachel dies. This happened near Ephrat. This is, we're going to build something here. Ephrat means place of fruitfulness. So can you, can you see what I mean? It would seem that Rachel's fruitfulness had ended. So in the, he appears in this place, which means fruit, place of fruitfulness. And Yah says, you're going to be fruitful. His wife dies. How would Yaakov continue to be fruitful if his last wife of fruit-bearing age had just died? Imagine how Yaakov would have felt when he found out that Yosef, Rachel's son had a son called Ephraim. Why is this important? Ephraim means doubly fruitful. So he meets Ephraim, who's technically Rachel's grandchild. Ah, now this is how Elohim's promise of you shall bear fruit and increase and make you an assembly of peoples would be fulfilled. A people connecting the dot. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, that is Beit Lehem. Ephrat was also Beit Lehem. This was the location where Messiah, the ultimate fruitfulness of Yaakov, would be born. In Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the Elohim and the Father of our Master Yeshua Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Messiah, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be set apart and blameless before him in love, having previously ordained us to an adoption as sons, through Yeshua Messiah to himself, according to the good pleasure of his desire, 
In Galatians 4, this idea of adoption as sons keeps going. But when the completion of the time came, Elohim sent forth his son, born of of a woman, born under Torah, to redeem those who were under Torah, the penalty of death. That's what Paul said. Yeshua was sent to redeem people from the penalty of death in order to receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, Elohim has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So much for the Holy Spirit being his own person, by the way. Paul saying it's the spirit of Yeshua. Hmm. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, also an heir of Elohim through Messiah. Yaakov adopted Yosef's two Egyptian sons so that they may be raised as Hebrews. Thus, you shall be fruitful. As he said just there, much in the same way, we are adopted into Elohim's household and snatched from Egypt. Because Manasseh and Ephraim, let's face it, they, they grew up in Egypt. They would have had a very privileged lifestyle in the palace. And uh, Yaakov is saying, no, these ch- children will be raised as Hebrews. Much in the same way, we've grown up in Egypt. We're now being called into the assembly of Elohim. Everyone with me? Cool. Let's... Uh, Hit Genesis 49. Just as a, a word of, um, I'm not going to cover so much about Menashe and Ephraim crossing the hands over and that, because we covered that in last week's Torah portion and in part one of Israel and our identity in Israel. But I'm going to bring something else to it. And Yaakov called his sons and said, Gather together so that I declare to you what is to befall you in the last days. So this is prophecy of, of end times. Gather together and hear, you sons of Yaakov, and listen to Yisrael, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my power and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of exaltation and the excellency of power. Boiling like water, you do not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, and he went up to my couch. Shimon and Levi are brothers, their weapons are implements of violence. Let my being not enter into their council. Let my esteem not be united to their assembly because they slew a man in their displeasure and they lamed an ox in in pleasure. This is referring to Shechem. Cursed be their displeasure for it is fierce and their wrath for it is cruel. I divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Yisrael. Where were the Levites when they were inherited the land? The Levites were scattered throughout all tribes. They weren't given land they were given cities in all tribes that they may be priests to the so this came to pass uh, shimon basically got swallowed up like the shimon existed more as a byword like there were people clinging onto their family line but shimon got swallowed up um we covered in the last torah portion of the cycle vetsot habracha uh, we covered this uh, of how simeon and levi there was a whole thing there go to that teaching for that you, Yehuda, your brothers praise you. Your hand is on the neck of your enemies and your father's children bow before you. Yehuda is a lion's cub from the prey you have gone up, my son. He bowed down, he crouched like a lion, and like a lion, who does rouse him? The scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him is the obedience of the peoples. Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Again, we covered this in part one Israel teaching. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun dwells at the seashore, for he is a haven of ships and his border is unto Sidon. So uh, Zebulun basically became merchants, it would seem. Yizekiah is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens and he saw that a resting place was good and the land was pleasant and he inclined his shoulder to bear a burden and became subject to slave labour. So here we see Yizekiah would have been um, manual labour, good for building stuff. Dan rightly rules his people as one of the tribes of Yisrael. Dan is a serpent, by the way, an adder by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider falls backwards. Uh, I have waited for your deliverance, O Yah. Does this sound familiar? Like a serpent, biting, crushing, a heel. Maybe to Genesis 3.14, and Yah Elohim said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all livestock and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you are to go and eat dust all the days of your life. Just before we go there, what was man made of? 
dust. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. Nice little... And I put your enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. Can we... Look, Dan, serpent bites the horse's heel. There's a link there. I don't... People will say that because of this, the Antichrist comes from Dan. You know, I'm, this is what's out there. I don't want to get into a discussion of Antichrist and stuff, but all I'm trying to point out, there's a connection. I don't fully understand the connection. I'll hold my head up, on, hold my hands up on that. Um, just wanted to point that out. Gad, a raiding band raids him, but he raids its heel. Bread is from Asher, is rich, and he gives delicacies of a sovereign. Naphtali is a, de- a deer let loose, he gives words of elegance. Um, so far, I just want to point out all the other, uh, apart from Judah, there's this understanding in, like, in Jewish thought that the reason Judah was given the, um, the eminency, the, the rule of the 12 brothers, was because all of the other tribes, their blessings were not good for leadership. If Gad is a raiding band, but he's getting raided all the time, it makes him unfit for leadership. Um, Asher, he's, he, they're more farmers. Farmers don't really deal with politics, as it were. Um, we read that, um, where is it? Like, Yisakar is a beast of burden. That means he's actually being ruled by people. So there was this thing that, it, because all the, other brother, all the other brothers were not fit for it, it landed on Yehuda. Just like an interesting thought. Um, now, okay, Yosef is an offshoot of a fruit-bearing tree, an offshoot of a free, fruit-bearing tree by a fountain. His branches run over a wall, and the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and have hated him. Now, we'll focus on verse 22 and 23. The King James puts it this way, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. When I was looking at the Hebrew for all of this, it's, it says something completely different, actually. If we translate it more literally, we get something like this. Joseph is a fruitful son, even a fruitful son by a well or an eye. The word uh, is ayin there. So it was the idea that the well was the eye of the landscape, whose daughters march over or around a wall. So... We just read that Ephraim means doubly fruitful. Ephraim was Joseph's son. So Joseph is a fruitful son. Why? Because of Manasseh and Ephraim. Even a fruitful son by a well. What did a well represent when we were covering Abraham and Yitzhak? It was a place of learning of the word. And it was also a place where you see like spiritual sight. So you look at the word and you're able to see what the word is saying whose daughters march over or around a wall. What does that sound like? What story? Jericho. Nice little illusions there. Uh, Jericho links to the uh, taking of the kingdom. It links to the Jubilee. There's all these interesting connections. The chief pierces. That's what the archer said. It literally says Baal and then the word for piercer or an arrow. The chief pierces have made him bitter and shot at him and hated, opposed or persecuted him. I, could, I found like a, there's an allusion to Yeshua there that the chief pierces have made him bitter. He was made to drink the bitter cup and they persecuted him. I just, and if Ephraim is waking up right now in the dispersion, People are going to make him bitter, shoot at him, and persecute, oppose him. All these little illusions, I don't quite fully get it. But I'm putting it out there. Maybe you guys can give me something back. But his bow, so yeah, his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty one of Yaakov. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Yisrael. Which is interesting, it's saying that from Yaakov, from Yisrael, the shepherd, the stone of Yisrael. Who was the good shepherd? Yeshua. Who was the stone that the builders rejected, but it was a marvellous thing? He ended up becoming the chief cornerstone, Yeshua. Yeshua comes from Yisrael, from Yaakov. From the El of your Father who helps you, and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heavens above, blessing of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. This is, um, what was Joseph given that the other brothers didn't have? The double portion blessing. I believe this is an allusion to that, the blessing, the dew of the earth, the, the abundance. 
The blessing of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the limit of the everlasting hills. They are on the head of Yosef and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. This implies that whoever Ephraim is, is going to be very blessed. Um, and not to get into uh, British Israelism, but some people have suggested that this is why the Western world is so successful, because of this. Not to start... I don't... I'm just putting it out there. Because I'm actually against British Israelism, but it would seem that the West are very well off. Maybe this could be an allusion to it. Binyamin is a wolf that tears. In the morning he eats prey, and at night he divides the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them, he blessed each one according to his own blessing. So each of the brothers had a particular blessing that was to bless the rest of the brothers. Each one of them had a talent, a gift. When Yisrael dwelt in unity, they were unstoppable. I mean, we read of the conquest they did. I mean, they took over the Canaanites, all the ites, kicked them out completely. And bear in mind, these people were giants. When Israel is unified and everyone's using their gifts to help one and another, great things happen. This is why unity is of paramount importance. This is why we went through the discipleship teaching. This is why we went through why all, all that stuff. We need unity because Paul says we all look through a glass dimly, which means that I see this bit and Ian, you see that bit, and Jez, you see that bit, and we all see different parts of the picture. If we could just get along and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Obviously, being, un being unified does not mean compromise. There's a big difference between being unified with someone, and because I see this happening in the Messianic or the Torah movement, whatever you want to call it. People go, oh, well, for the sake of unity, I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. So basically, you're saying, for the sake of unity, I'm going to sin. That's, let's call it out for what it is. Do we become unified with people at the cost of our own righteousness? No, let it not be. As Paul says, we establish the Torah. And he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, and in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, and the land of Canaan, which Avraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial site. There they buried Avraham and Sarah, his wife. And there they buried Yitzhak and Rivka. And there I buried Leah. What's really interesting, it wasn't the wife he loved that was buried in the tomb of the fathers. So you can get into this whole thing. There's a type and shadow of the bride and the unloved bride and the foreign... Anyway. <laughs> the field purchased and the cave which is in it from the sons of Heth. And when Yaakov ended commanders his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. He dies. Sad times. You know, a man of faith. So much so, he was included in uh, Hebrews 11. And Yosef fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Yosef commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Yisrael. And forty days were completed for him, and so are completed the days of embalming. And the Mitzrites wept for him for seventy days. I mean, that's like nearly two months. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Yosef spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now... If I have found grace or favour in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, See, I am dying. Bury me in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. And now please let me go up and bury my father and return. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So we have... Of everyone returning to the land, which is interesting. And his sons did to him as he commanded. For his sons brought him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a property for a burial site. And after he had buried his father, Yosef returned to Mitzrayim, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. And when Yosef's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Yosef hates us and pays us back all the evil which we did to him? And they, So what does this sound like, actually? It sounds uh, like Esau, when he was saying, When my father's dead, I'm going to kill my brother Yaakov. But here we have the opposite. The outcome becomes the opposite. 
And they sent word to Yosef, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, This is what you are to say to Yosef. I beg you, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of, uh, of the Elohim of your father. And Yosef wept when they spoke to him. It just shows what, where Yosef was in his walk, how spiritually mature he was. And his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, see, we are your servants. And Yosef said to them, do not fear, for I am I in the place of Elohim. We'll, we'll look at this. And you, you intended evil against me. So he reminds them, yes, you did evil. You did do evil, but Elohim intended it for good in order to do it as it is to this day, to keep, to keep a great many people alive. I mean, this is forgiveness, scriptural forgiveness. People think that when you forgive someone, it's forgive and forget, and never mind what you did. Look, he remembered what they did, but he genuinely said, it's okay. Elohim meant it for good. People, forgiveness is not an avenue to be trodden over like a doormat. People, this is where Christianity fails. Um, they say, oh, well, forgive and forget. And it's like, so you're supposed to just forgive. And let, let's say there's an abusive relationship between a husband and a wife. What, the wife is meant, oh, it's fine. You beat me up every night. I forgive you. Torah is about preservation of life. Let's use common sense. Like, you, you are to forgive him, but he needs to repent. Again, forgiveness... Doesn't mean hold a grudge, but it doesn't mean just let it all go because that's foolishness. And now, do not fear, I provide for you and your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I want to posit the question could you do that? Um, could someone that's genuinely done something horrific to you and they genuinely repent, there's the key, they genuinely repent, would you be able to do that? Because we're called to do that. If they genuinely repent, there's the key. Some people will say they've repented and their actions will show otherwise. And yet, so let's look at this. Do not fear, for, I'm, for am I in the place of Elohim? I love what um, the software said. I've got this software that cross-references stuff and they give you little comments every now and then. It belongs to God to execute vengeance and Joseph did not intend to usurp his prerogative. Thus he instructed his brethren not to fear him, but to fear God, to humble themselves before God and to seek his forgiveness. Wow. So when stuff is done to you, is it your job to go and give God's vengeance out? Unless Elohim specifically comes down, sends an angel and says, you need to meet out my wrath. And usually he'll get an angel to do that. Just say it. When you are wronged, what's your duty? Leave it in the hands of Elohim. When people are sinning, when, when there's murder, when there's genocide, yes, it's wrong. Yes, it's, it's horrific. Elohim is going to sort that out no matter where, all around the world. And Yosef dwelt in Mitzrayim, he and his father's household. And Yosef lived 110 years. And Yosef saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, were also brought up on Yosef's knees. So he got to see his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and his great-great-grandchildren. Now, to put this into perspective, this is Levi's family tree. So you see Levi had Gerashon, Kahat, Merari. Then from Kahat you have Amram. And if you look at Amram, you have Moshe, Miriam and Aaron. If you look at Yitzhar, you have Korah. This is the Korah, you know, they got swallowed up in the ground. Korah was a cousin of Moshe. So that adds some new light to that story. Um, the point I'm trying to make, when Levi, when all the brothers went into the land, Levi's three sons were already born. If you read the genealogy of when the, when the sons of Yisrael went into Egypt to sit with Yosef, Gerishon, Kehat, and Merari were already born. The numbers, by the way, is how long they lived. So when did, uh, how old was Moshe when he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt? 80. There's Moshe. Gerishon, Kehat, and Merari were already in Egypt. That means that the slavery did not last 400 years. They were afflicted, but the actual slavery part, 100 years tops, tops. And that's a gener generous, they, weren't, they were literally only in enslavement for a, a generation. Just an interesting fact, because if you work out the numbers, you know, the, 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 the genealogies don't lie. Just wanted to throw that out there. When it says, Yosef saw his great-great-grandchildren, those great-great-grandchildren would have been crossing the Red Sea. 
and they would have probably died when all the, you know, when only Kalev and um, Yehoshua, Joshua survived. They would have been wasted, laid low. Unless they were under 20, we don't know that. Just, just to help you kind of put the biblical timeline in perspective. And Yosef said to his brothers, I am dying, but Elohim shall certainly visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Yitzhak and to Yaakov. And Yosef made the children of Israel swear, saying, Elohim shall certainly visit you and shall bring, you shall bring up my bones from here, doing what his father Yaakov said. And Yosef died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Mitzrayim. In Hebrews 11 verse 22, by faith, by belief, Yosef, when he was dying, made mention of the outgoing of the children of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Which way was he looking? Forward. He was looking beyond him. Not only are we called to look forward, we're called to look beyond, to that eternal destiny. Yosef believed the promises so much. He was like, you're going to take me up, you will be delivered. Do we have that type of faith?